Okay. Um, welcome to our presentation um, on the ethical and legal implications of artificial intelligence. Uh, my name is Jens Berger. I'm a postdoc at Leuven AI. And uh, Leuven AI is the KU Leuven Institute for Artificial Intelligence. We are currently combining more than 85 senior AI researchers across the University of Leuven, uh, among others in fields like machine learning and data science, language, speech and vision, reasoning, acting, decision making, applications of AI. Uh, and what we put a focus on today in this presentation are the, is the research line, philosophical, ethical, legal and societal implications of AI. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues. OK, so good uh, morning or afternoon or evening uh, to all of you uh, who view this. Um, so my name is Jan de Bruyne. As it's mentioned, I'm a research expert working at CITIP, and my focus is uh, on the liability and especially tort liability and product liability. And although my colleagues here will disagree probably, but I think that uh, extra contractual liability and product liability is one of the core issues when it comes to AI, because when damage is caused, of course, people want to get compensation. Now, that is not surprisingly, that is a recurring topic um, in several EU documents and eh, the need for an appropriate legal framework dealing with the allocation of liability between actors involved in the AI supply chain. So there are many initiatives at the EU level, which is, of course, a very good. Nevertheless, when we look at reality, uh, tort law, uh, by, by far tort law, especially tort law, one could say, is very nationally bound. So there's, you will have to look at national law as well to determine whether what, is, what the application of the EU rules, EU legal framework might imply. For example, eh, the, the many EU initiatives focus on the liability of the operator, uh, but he will not be able to, he will escape liability when, for example, there's force majeure. The concept of force majeure is determined by national law as is the concept of, of negligence, for example, to determine when an actor, an operator or a producer is held liable uh, for negligence for a negligent act requires national law. So you actually, uh, you actually have what I call the AI tort law dilemma, which might be really useful for EU and national policymakers to take into account that you have the EU level, which could set the, 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 the main rules, but you have the national judges which, which have to apply and which will have to determine the notions of these concepts. This is my first key takeaway already. The second one is that, of course, uh, go back maybe to the previous slide, thank you. Um, the second one, of course, is the fact that AI, as in many other fields, uh, creates some, uh, some tensions, some, some, uh, it challenges some traditional concepts. I already held the, the, the I already took the example of negligence of a producer determining whether whether the producer of an AI system is held is negligent is is not is very is not straightforward because to, to determine the, the act of negligent the negligent act for example you will have to look at the AI system itself of course eh, due to, to the non transparency and the fact that it's self learning it becomes really challenging for example to determine when an uh, when an when a producer or potentially an operator when this uh, eu framework would become applicable is held liable another element of course a product liability directive refers to notions such as the concept of a product eh? it imposes strict liability upon the producer of a product that causes uh, damage because of a defect well the question is is software considered a product the product liability directive refers to the notion of a movable. Eh? So the question is, can software as an intangible item be considered as a product? This is a big debate, uh, as is the question when an uh, AI system is considered defective. Eh? In the EU, we look at the uh, consumer expectation test. So an AI, a defective product means that this does not provide you the safety that one is entitled to expect. So you, you look at the legitimate consumer expectations. Well, this is very broad. Eh? Um, how will you apply this? Um, uh, to AI systems, what can we expect from safety when it comes to an AI system? So these are many challenges that the EU is currently facing and addressing at different levels. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, we, I will see that I will give you some food for thought. Of course, we only had five minutes uh, and there's much more to say. Uh, but what, what I think is really necessary and where the EU could really play an important role, yeah, reconsider the interaction, reconsider the fact that we have this dilemma of EU law and the application interpretation at the national level. But I think the EU can play a really important role in providing specific criteria and providing concrete 
um, notions of this term. How would you apply um, uh, a, a, a notion of defect? How would you define it with some concrete examples, some concrete criteria that one can use, that judges can use to uh, when they are confronted with the question whether an AI system, for example, would be defective? I also think that there should be a lot of attention. There is already attention, but it could be really much more attention to the question of the burden of proof. And victims will have to prove whether a product is defective, whether a producer acted negligently. Well, here again, it's a huge burden of proof, and you might consider uh, the reversing the burden of proof and look at national alternatives. Um, I also would say um, that, that the, especially in tort law and product liability, uh, judges, um, will apply this. Eh? So, so in Belgium, tort law is, is case law. Eh? A lot of cases determining the notions. Uh, but there again, the question remains whether judges really have this technical knowledge to apply these concepts. Are they well trained? So I think the EU should also could also play an important role in focusing on the role of judges. And considering that uh, you would, for example, have national interpretations of certain concepts, uh, for example, a product, defectiveness, the operator's liability in the future, um, I think that when we should think of new ways of other alternatives to ensure uniformity within case law, because the horizontal um, soft law or regulations at the EU level, this is one thing, but you have to prevent that they are applied differently in, the, in, in, in member states because of this interpretation. Um, this was my short presentation, and, and uh, I, I very much look forward to the remaining uh, 10, 15 minutes of the other speakers. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, I I start by disagreeing with you on the fact that uh, you think I disagree with you. I very much agree with you on the uh, importance of product liability. Um, I think that copyright plays uh, um, a very interesting role in there, more generally, as I will uh, discuss. But uh, you know, you make a ref you made a reference about uh, the lack of transparency, and I think that this is. Uh, um, one of the core areas of my uh, research, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm focusing on the role of data and especially the data that is being used to train uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, systems, uh, specifically from the point of view of copyright and uh, rights related to copyright. So for example, not uh, personal data, uh, but the data that uh, uh, whereas from a technical scientific point of view, it's just called data from a corporate point of view should be um, classified in various categories. We have, uh, you know, just illustratively uh, mere facts and data, which copyright theory uh, has that uh, they are not protected. But, you know, the reality is uh, quite different, especially due to new legislation. We have traditional works of authorship, so protected by full copyright. Uh, these are, you know, scientific articles, movies, and because the threshold of, for originality in EU law is quite low, I would say also most tweets. Uh, we have other subject matters, so things that are similar but are protected uh, through a thinner layer of copyright uh, because they are not so original. And then we have this uh, purely European creature called uh, SWI generis database right, which is a form of protection of data, uh, as a matter of fact, for databases that require a substantial investment in obtaining this data. Uh, what does this mean? We'll see that in the next slide. Um, it means that different types of data have different access conditions. So not all data that from a technical AI point of view we could identify as a uniform category that we need in order to train our algorithms. From a legal point of view, they come with different access conditions, which means with different costs calculated both as a, a monetary costs, but also as other forms of costs connected with uh, um, the identification of the owner, the identification, first of all, of whether they are protected, through which rights, whom that right belongs to, under which conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Which means that uh, uh, AI developers who may have and usually have different uh, budget capacities, different risk propensions, different uh, laws that apply to them depending on what is their corporate structure, um, may decide to, to use different categories of data, but not on the basis of the inner quality of this data. So whether this data is complete, is up to date, is accurate, it's uh, non-biased, 
but probably also, or you know, we can discuss how much, but on the basis of other categories which escape this uh, quality of data argument. And these categories are exactly what I uh, listed, legal considerations, economic considerations, risk considerations. Um, what does this mean for EU AI? Next slide, please. Uh, it means that the current legislative framework uh, strongly favors incumbent players because, you know, we know who the big uh, AI developers are, and usually these big AI developers have their own databases. They have their own collection of data that they can use to train their own data. In this case, they don't need to seek uh, specific uh, uh, permissions because this is already done when users upload their content on these platforms. Uh, but this also means that uh, small, uh, uh, you know, small and medium uh, uh, enterprises, startups, nonprofits, they usually lack the financial and structural organizations to clear those rights on uh, usual individual basis, because right now it's impossible it, or it's very difficult, I should say, to negotiate licenses on individual basis. Uh, collective management at the moment in this area, it's, uh, you know, non-existent as far as I can tell. Um, and obviously, this leads also to a different type of discriminations between EU and non-EU firms, because what, something that we haven't said so far is that outside the EU, um, training um, uh, algorithms for uh, uh, machine learning purposes is usually considered uh, lawful from a copyright point of view. So once again, we have a, a, a type of European legislation that strongly favors incumbents and strongly favors non-EU firms. Next slide, please. Um, is this good? <laughs> I, clearly, my assessment here, it's not uh, uh, too uh, optimistic, but I think that there is still space and scope for corporate law to favor an open, accountable and transparent AI environment. I think that the latest legislative developments, especially in the corporate digital single market directive, uh, fail to deliver in this specific uh, aspect. There is still some uh, space to intervention at the national level with implementation. Um, there are other interventions, uh, especially the public sector directive, open data directive that seem more functional to an open and transparent AI. And more broadly, part of my research focuses on rethinking the classification of comput computational uses in corporate law, both from a theoretical and a governance point of view. Um, so thank you very much, and I look forward to the rest of the conference. Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whatever. I am Geertere van Overwalle, and I will take you through the story of AI and patent law and focus on transparency and openness. First, simple but basic question. Are AI inventions patentable? Well, as you may know, computer programs, algorithms as such are excluded from patent protection. All the more, AI would be excluded from patent protection since they make use of computational models. However, inventions where software is implemented in machines or where software uh, provide a solution for a technical problem may become eligible for patent protection. So I would claim that likewise, uh, patents may be awarded when, when I leave the pure abstract domain and applies is being applied to solve a technical problem. Inventions in that regard are indeed considered and qualified, so I mean AI inventions, follow this reasoning and are therefore categorized in the category of computer implemented inventions. The definition being inventions which involve computers, computer networks, or rather programmable apparatus, whereby at least one feature is realized by means of a program. Next slide. You, I think you, you know, no, you, you know, lots of examples which would qualify as computer complement, implemented inventions. Now, given the fact that it's in principle patentable, then the question came up, who's the inventor? And usually three categories are put forward. First, human-made inventions, where humans, inventors, use AI for the verification of the outcome. Second, I've called them human-related inventions, 
where a human identifies a problem, but where AI is used to find a solution. And then last but not least, AI made inventions in which AI identifies a problem, proposes a solution without human intervention. So AI can independently invent without human direction, instruction and oversight. So who's the inventor in those three categories? Well, it's commonly agreed that in the first two categories, AI is used as a tool for human inventors, augmenting their capabilities. So the human inventor, the natural person is inventor. As to the third category, the EPO in, his right, in their writings firmly say, the third trajectory is a matter of undefined future and thus science fiction. And they haven't even tried to answer that question. Now, the idea that the inventor should be a natural person has been put to the test uh, by, putting, uh, by, by submitting two patent applications. Two patent applications, the one to the left and the one uh, to, to the right, the Dukan um, invention related methodology. And if you take a close look, push the button, you will see indeed there's no inventor. But if you look below the inventor, there is an applicant. So the one who's going to have return on investment is known and will uh, be able to set up a profitable business if he or she wants so. Next. So that brings us to openness. Given the fact that AI inventions are patent eligible, to that having no inventor is not really problematic, brings up uh, the question, is the grant of patents for AI, AI related inventions, is that meeting the social, the social contract we have embedded in patent law? Is there a quid pro quo? And then, and I think that is a real discussion and it feeds into what Thomas has said about transparency, the social contract is an exclusive right in return for investment and invention, and on the other hand, disclosure of the invention. Disclosure in a way that the invention is reproducible, can be reworked by a person skilled in the art. Now we know from experience that in software, the invention is hardly disclosed. You see a scheme of acts, but you don't get the code. That's all the more so with AI. So I think that is a really problematic issue because AI use, uh, uses algorithms not disclosed. And secondly, as some have rightly pointed out, training data, which are not revealed either. And that brings me to two concluding thoughts or rather questions. To what extent is this fierce debate on inventorship relevant since even in cases where no inventor is mentioned, the applicant is a natural person recouping investment when making use of AI. So why are we also upset both in, in the legislatures, the academics, the patent offices? And then secondly, and I think for me that is the, the key problem, if AI patents are granted, what happens to the social contract, to the social bargain? Where is the balance between the rights and the scope of the rights awarded to the inventor investor on the one hand side and the knowledge disclosed in the interest of society and improvement of knowledge. Important question. I don't have the answers, but thank you for listening.